everybody else for your uh, wonderful presentations uh, so far. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my presentation today will uh, outline some of the research that I've undertaken so far for my uh, doctoral dissertation. Um, uh, I'm doing kind of an overview, so uh, I'm going to probably uh, skip quite a lot of uh, you know, very important parts. I, I apologize. Um, and basically, uh, in general, I'm looking at uh, filmmaking in Oceania, um, uh, very broad again. Uh, in uh, mostly recent films in the last few decades, uh, and I'm going to try to uh, today uh, kind of pick and choose as many, uh, show you as many examples of these films as I can, uh, instead of just focusing on like one, right? So uh, actually the, the project will cover quite a few films as uh, case studies, uh, comparative case studies, but uh, today I'll just choose uh, some of the, the, my favorite, I guess, the best ones, uh, which I think will be more worthwhile for you uh, as well. So uh, first, uh, I just wanted to mention that it, it's extremely difficult, uh, especially here in the allotted time, to uh, track the entire history of cinema, uh, filmmaking, etc., do even documentary in, in the Pacific Islands. So I'm going to fast forward very uh, far into about 1991, uh, which is when the uh, so something that I think is very significant for uh, a lot of the films that I talk about in the thesis and also today is that uh, many of them were funded uh, and or at least uh, partially funded uh, maybe in collaboration with uh, a center called the Pacific Islanders in Communications. This was founded uh, again in 1991. It's based in Hawaii, but they take an approach to um, documentary and other uh, kind of media projects to uh, well, the mission statement uh, is on the screen behind me, right? And so, um, again, the history is very long, but uh, in recent years, the uh, quality and quantity of the filmmaking, uh, you know, things like digital video, which makes uh, cinema more, filmmaking more accessible to people, especially in islands, which are generally very remote places, Right, um, and also, uh, you know, few islands in the Pacific. I think uh, one of the difficulties again, uh, not just uh, accessing uh, but supporting a, a very strong, robust film industry, even with uh, very small uh, islands populations uh, and their sorry their populations and uh, economies. Right, you know, we don't even have many film uh, sort of movie theaters and things like that. Um, but again, uh, a good example of uh, a way that's changing is the, uh, this program, right? So, uh, and besides that, right, there have also been, uh, you know, in recent years, um, the, the other pictures behind the Pacific Heartbeat series by, uh, this was kind of part of, uh, I think, a larger initiative to kind of center our attention in media and on film on uh, voices from the uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, communities, right? So this was a program that featured films uh, from the Pacific as well as, uh, well, I think quite a bit from the Pacific, right? There was, uh, it was in conjunction with one about Asian Americans, right? But uh, this was hosted by uh, PBS, right? It's like a, uh, the NHK of, of America, kind of. Uh, <laughs> that, that's how uh, a lot of people ask me in Japan about that. So uh, that's how I explain it. Uh, anyway, so they've also been uh, kind of instrumental in bringing more of these films to the forefront, uh, to more people, to more film festivals, uh, having screening events, and also, of course, funding the films, uh, supporting the filmmakers, uh, etc. Uh, and then, of course, uh, some other uh, great things that have been happening are, uh, you know, film festivals uh, in the area, uh, in Hawaii and Guam, for example. Uh, I think all, all the films that I've uh, outlined today have uh, been screened at these festivals at least once, right, uh, in, in some kind of program, uh, either in competition or out of competition. Um, and then uh, also uh, another great one in the corner was the Amnesia uh, program uh, for uh, documentaries. Uh, I, I think they were very open-ended with what they considered documentary, right? So there was a little bit of uh, kind of narrative films 
uh, again, but a uh, big focus on documentary. This was in uh, Yamagata, in Tohoku, uh, for the Yamagata International Documentary Film Festival in 2019, I believe, yes, in 2019. Uh, and so many of the films I talk about today, again, were present in this uh, film program, uh, which was uh, very inspirational to my research, uh, not just the ideas, but for actually providing me a way to see these films because a lot of them are uh, not in, in wide, wide circulation and not distributed, at, at least on home video and stuff. Uh, and in Japan especially, which is where I am now, uh, it, it was quite difficult to see these films uh, again. So uh, again, there's, there's quite a few of these uh, programs uh, in, the, in terms of film festivals. Uh, and I think these were, um, especially the one at Yamada that was extremely important because they, they showed these films together, right? It was, uh, it, it was a showcase of otherwise, you know, uh, things that these, some of these films were shown in American sort of film festivals uh, as part of this minority, uh, minority showcase or something. And uh, for the first time, I think they were considered as uh, all part of a kind of wider a regional, right, oceanic kind of uh, uh, films, right? And so uh, that was important to me, was being able to see these films uh, side by side and make some interesting comparisons uh, and, and seeing how they kind of aligned in a lot of ways, right? There's a lot of parallels between them. Um, and so I think this has kind of helped in the identity, right, of uh, of films coming from small Pacific islands, uh, be, because it's extremely difficult, uh, especially when we talk about films, because we always, you know, slap things like the, the country, the nationality, right, on the film. Uh, even if we go, you know, transnational, that it, that still complicates uh, a lot of the the very real geopolitical situations that many of islands face, uh, small islands within larger uh, island chains even, uh, it, it, it's very difficult, right, to talk about, categorize some of these films. Uh, and so uh, seeing them here in Oceania uh, as a, in a greater regional identity uh, helped to kind of solidify this, right, uh, and, and kind of bring together what these films, I think, would otherwise have been lost in a, in a larger kind of uh, concept of something like uh, minority, American minority cinema, something like that. Right? Um, so that was, uh, those were kind of uh, ways that I saw Oceania uh, being kind of promoted now, which I think is good for, for filmmaking, right, in the islands. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, some of these films also highlighted uh, not just Oceania as a regional identity, but uh, something a little bit beyond that, right? Uh, and it became increasingly obvious to me that these uh, kind of networked islands in the Pacific were uh, not entirely closed, right, it, within this Oceania region. Uh, what I mean is that uh, the, the Pacific Ocean also borders, of course, continental uh, bodies like the U.S., uh, Japan is included, uh, and many of them uh, also captured, I think, these uh, very complex and entangled histories between the Pacific uh, not just the past, but that echo into the into the present uh, and into the future, right? Uh, and so uh, I think we cannot uh, ignore, right, these uh, connections, right? Sorry, sorry. Uh, even, even though Oceania as an identity is very important, right? So um, to me, I think uh, one of the most important uh, kind of threads in Pacific Island studies uh, and also in uh, American studies, I suppose, is to uh, think uh, in, in terms of the archipelago. This is uh, a, a group of islands, right? But uh, here it's, it's sort of a, a way of thinking, a kind of uh, concept to understand the relation between uh, Pacific islands and the uh, kind of larger nation states. It usually, uh, in my case studies, uh, especially today, I, I talk mostly about the US, but also Japan. And uh, it, it's kind of the, uh, I quote here, study of places that are connected by complex processes that traverse geographical spaces. Uh, but it also suggests, you know, a kind of rethinking of the relations between uh, these islands and, yeah, the mainlands like the US. Um, we see how islands can change our perspective in, in terms of things like, uh, you know, the Pacific especially. Uh, oftentimes we see these islands as being dependent 
Uh, we see these islands as being uh, subordinate. Uh, you know, aid is a big topic, things like that. Uh, and I think many of these documentaries uh, kind of change this uh, point of view, right? They kind of politicize the relation uh, between the U.S. and uh, many of these islands uh, and frame some very uh, interesting and uh, very pertinent issues. Right? Uh, and so I believe filmmakers have taken a kind of approach that also uh, utilizes uh, kind of a, a more, they're much more considerate of the kind of the voice of the islanders, right? And uh, I think through this kind of voice as well, uh, which is, uh, you know, both literal and figurative, they let the islanders speak in films. Um, there's a minimal presence of the, the filmmaker uh, narration, things like that, that kind of dictates how, sh how we should understand these stories. Uh, and they kind of emphasize uh, showing over telling, right, uh, in many of these films, uh, which I think is uh, interesting, right? It, it, and they also place them in contrast with things like uh, documents, um, you know, archival footage, newsreels, etc. Uh, and I think that's kind of uh, important, right? That sort of frames uh, a lot of the, the ways we kind of understand these islands in media, right? And we are putting this uh, this kind of voice, right, of the islanders uh, it back, right, and also in contrast, uh, juxtaposed with, uh, you know, how we used to understand uh, the islands through uh, things like film and news footage. Uh, so let me just start to get to the case studies. I'll, I'll try to go through them uh, really quick. Uh, I'm not sure if we can show the preview of this one, but let me try here. Okay, three minutes left. Okay. Okay, uh, so I probably won't have time to see. Uh, it's okay, I'll skip the preview, I'm sorry. So um, what, one of the films in my case studies is uh, Between Tides. This one is about the uh, Ogasawara Islands, uh, the Bonin Islands, right? Uh, so, for example, how can we uh, think of the, the very complex history of these islands, which, uh, of course, now belong to Japan, uh, you know, they're very remote, they're kind of this tourist destination, but, uh, you know, in between tides, uh, this is a film by, the director is uh, Masa Fox, he's a half Japanese, half American. Uh, he has never lived here, but uh, he explains the, and kind of lets the islanders uh, tell their history, uh, especially, uh, he focuses on the, what they call the Navy generation. Like they grew up. <clears throat> they they grew up uh, during the American naval occupation. This was in the immediate post-war, right? And uh, they lived through that, and they kind of came of age after the islands uh, went back to Japan in 19, I believe, 1972. Um, I might be wrong. It might be a little earlier. Uh, anyway, the dates are a bit difficult here, right? Uh, but anyway, the, the shift in authority uh, between uh, the U.S. and Japan has uh, resulted in many of the islanders being silenced, I believe, over time. Uh, and uh, this is kind of unfortunate because they've had a very interesting uh, history in terms of things like uh, citizenship. Uh, they were issued, you know, temporary passports, uh, which was uh, a big topic, I think, here. I have, this is a photo of, uh, I think, one of them. And so uh, they were kind of, uh, you know, rejected by both the U.S. and Japan, and the, the islanders themselves felt that they were in a very ambiguous place. Uh, and uh, again, instead of, uh, what I think is interesting about this film is when you interview, uh, when, when the filmmaker interviews the, uh, the islanders, uh, they are actually not so concerned about this sort of national identity uh, or citizenship, which they're issued through a passport. Uh, instead, they kind of foreground that they're proud of their islandness and that they, um, you know, despite these very complex histories uh, that have, uh, you know, shifted the shifts in power for the island. Okay, uh, so let me just wrap up. Uh, I'll, I'll very quickly talk about the uh, other two films, right? Um, the other two films I wanted to talk about were uh, in the Federated States of Micronesia. It, this, this film, uh, Island Soldier, talks about the um, uh, conscription of the uh, uh, islanders as part of the Compact of Free Association. Um, they're, of course, very critical of this uh, 
of this uh, policy, right? Uh, and again, uh, this one uh, from Hawaii, right? Critical of the uh, the prison system that displaces uh, many of the prison inmates in Hawaii. There's kind of a big overflow in the prisons uh, and sends them to the mainland U.S. And so uh, it, it, it's a very uh, very sad story, but uh, highlights some uh, extremely important issues uh, in Hawaii, right? Uh, and its sort of relation to the mainland uh, United States. So uh, I'm sorry again, uh, I'm out of time, and I couldn't uh, quite uh, show all the films. That, that would probably take, uh, even the previews would take quite a bit of time. But uh, so some of my, my concluding thoughts is just that uh, I think filmmaking, especially if we, if we look at uh, not just Oceania, but uh, as, as uh, look at kind of archipelagos as a way to think about the relations between islands uh, and how it is uh, illustrated uh, or represented in the films. Uh, there, there have been a lot of uh, great examples in recent years, uh, and I can only hope that uh, you know filmmaking in the region would uh, take off even more. I'd like to see more interesting examples in the future. Thank you. <coughs> Have around four minutes for question and answer. Let's welcome all kind of questions. I know I've seen, yeah. I know I've seen put up a few festivals and things like that. Um, but uh, I was wondering, like, um, uh, so uh, in Toronto they have a uh, the Imaginative Film Festival. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, it's, a, it's a really large international festival, and they bring in a lot of uh, island cultures. Uh, the films there, yes, yes. Um, and, and indigenous uh, films, um, and presenting there. So I, I've, I've often seen them, but I, I was wondering if that was a festival you've gone to or thought of. Or have I been there? Yeah, have you been there? No, 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 I have not. <laughs> But uh, yes, I, actually, I think uh, at least one, if not a few, festivals have uh, should have been shown there. Um, I I do talk in the um, sorry. Let me go back a little bit. Uh, I, I did talk about uh, the, it, this film. I think is especially interesting because it's had such a hard time finding an identity. But uh, in I think the program you mentioned. Uh, I, it might have been an Asian American okay, Pacific yeah, Islander. Sure. I'm not sure. And uh, yeah, so the director has kind of uh, been all over the place, right? And, <laughs> and I think he's uh, yes been uh, probably part of that one. Uh, I, in in a couple other places too. Yeah. So uh, I, I was talking about. Uh, I think my main point uh, I, I didn't make today but, uh, about this film is the, the whole film, the way he positioned the film in film festivals was uh, very interesting, right? It kind of created its own identity for the film because there was not really a, a, a country he could attach it to. Right. right. Yeah, it's quite often the uh, only vehicle for distribution for those kinds of films is the film festival circuit. So. Yes, yes, yes. And so on. You know, he, he screened it in Japan because obviously the, the Ogasawara are, are part of Japan, but uh, I, I think he's been more active uh, yeah, in North America, I suppose. But, yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, I know, Chris, thank you very much. I know you focused on documentary film, but can I talk about Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood comes out in the Pacific where they go to a small island and how the islands are depicted in, in the film. Right. I know that there's a really good case in New Zealand where uh, Hollywood went to New Zealand and filmed The Last Samurai. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a really good case study about you know, how people it, it, it generated pride, uh, it, it created uh, a lot of jobs and opportunities in, in the film. But they didn't depict, it was, it was supposed to be Japan, not New Zealand. Uh, right, uh, but when Hollywood comes to the island, sometimes they, the, 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 well, first of all, the, the residents get all excited that Hollywood's coming, right. and you know everybody's all starry-eyed. But then when they watch the film, they're really well. Some some people are disappointed that, uh, because of the stereotypes, you know, the way the, the islands are depicted with people. And so how should you know how should uh, these islands approach? Um, when, when they're approached by Hollywood, mm -hmm. what are some things that uh, maybe these these places should keep in mind when working with uh, the filmmakers? Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. 
question. Yes. Uh, so, well, I think the directors of these films, uh, I'm not, uh, again, documentary, not narrative film or fictional film, but, um, you know, I, I found that um, uh, what, one of the things I couldn't talk about was the, the voice, right? That, that's kind of my approach <coughs> is that uh, actually there's very little directorial, I mean, of course, uh, that's very debatable, but there's very little uh, sort of, uh, they, they don't, use these, these narration techniques and stuff so much, in documentary, of course. But uh, in fictional film, you know, like I heard uh, in Moana, they had this, what do you call that, uh, 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 advisory board, I think that's what it was, and they had these scholars come in and perhaps in, inform them about uh, the, these customs and stuff like that. Um, so I don't really have an answer about what exactly, but. You, you know, in general, I would just say I think we, we have to be mindful of the uh, in between tides, especially he looks at and he shows in the film the ways that uh, Japan especially approached them in the past and depicted them, and he has a dialogue with them how they feel about this representation, and so uh, I, I saw that as you know kind of reclaiming their their agency there. So I think considering you know the, the history of these island peoples on the screen already would be a very uh, advisable thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see the time is up. Thank you, Christine, for your presentation. So the next presenter. Okay, our next presenter is uh, the pre-meditating Curtis. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and uh, really? yes. Where is the? <coughs> oh, this one. Okay. Sorry, do you recognize which one is your file? Oh, uh, so many files. Uh, the one this, uh, it's all called a presentation. No, I don't no. see that. I see. Uh, I should right. say Hiroshi. Hiroshi. Rather. Maybe in the previous folder? Yes, no. Ah, here yeah, yes. oh, okay, okay. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Do you also need to play the movies? Okay. Do you have a movie file? Yeah, I do. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Um, uh, well, um, uh, so, um, first, sorry, I just wanted to, to recognize and thank um, our uh, hosts here who have been so gracious. Uh, um, I've just, uh, the uh, sake tasting and the tea ceremony this afternoon were just so great. And all the presentations have just been fabulous. So thank you so much. It's a privilege to really be here. Um, I, um, my name is Stephen Foster, um, and uh, I'm an indigenous media artist. So a little bit different here from some of the other folks uh, doing presentations. Um, I uh, grew up in Vancouver Island and have mixed indigenous ancestry. Um, and I'm going to talk, uh, my presentation today, I'll talk a little bit about, well, maybe a lot, about uh, Edward Sheriff Curtis uh, and the impact uh, uh, he's had through his photography and filmmaking on uh, Hollywood filmmaking and uh, popular images of indigeneity. I'm going to talk a little bit about artist responses to that kind of work, and then I'm going to talk about my own work a little bit. So uh, let's go to the first one. So. Um, I don't know how many people know about Edward Sheriff Curtis, but uh, uh, he's uh, a, a photographer um, who was uh, a, essentially a, a portrait photographer from the uh, early part of the uh, 20th century, at the turn of that century, um, and then at the be very beginnings of photography um, and, uh, and of filmmaking. And um, um, I always like to show this kind of combination of slide because one of the things I'd like to reiterate through this uh, presentation is this kind of connection historically that happens between uh, ethnography or what was early ethnography, um, uh, museums and artifact collection and things like that and uh, popular culture and popular images. So here on the far right we have, uh, uh, if everybody can remember Johnny Depp from, uh, I think it was like uh, 2008 or something like that anyway, the uh, Tonto character. Um, and he, at the time, he got a lot of uh, flack for his costume uh, because it seemed quite ridiculous. Uh, and it was a little bit. But um, uh, he cited this painting by uh, Kirby Satchler, 
uh, who was a uh, kind of a Western painter uh, in the 60s and 70s, I believe, um, as his source image for why he created this. But of course, we see on the far left Edward Sheriff Curtis's photograph from 2004, or sorry, <laughs> 1904, um, as a, a source for the, the painting. So it's that kind of level of connection. And I, and I think, uh, you know, um, one of you know, the thoughts around Curtis, of course, is, you know, he, uh, uh, there's a lot of criticism around his work because uh, he would uh, swap artifacts between different cultures, um, you know, for dramatic effect. Um, he would uh, make, uh, make uh, his subjects wear makeup. Often, uh, if they didn't appear dark enough, uh, he would make them wear shoe polish to make them look darker uh, for his photographs. These kinds of things look more indigenous. And he was also very famous at removing any information that um, demonstrated uh, a contemporariness to their uh, culture. So anything uh, that was, uh, um, you know, reflected uh, uh, contact with, uh, um, with uh, European culture was removed. Um, you know, famously, um, uh, although he spent a whole lot of time on the northwest coast uh, on Vancouver Island and that, uh, documenting um, uh, the cultures of the time, he never did take a picture of a button blanket. <laughs> so it's kind of an interesting thing. So, uh, but uh, we will continue on. I think, you know, to um, just let me make sure I cover all my notes here. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, I'll get to it a little bit later too, but um, his work, uh, uh, he, he also, because he was always trying to finance this big project, which was uh, his encyclopedia at the North American Indian, where he was going to go around and document every single uh, indigenous culture in North America and photograph them. It was a big project, his lifelong dream. Uh, he was always looking for ways to augment that. And I'll talk a little bit more about one of the strategies in a bit, but um, uh, part of that is that he worked in and out of Hollywood. Uh, so in, in some cases he was, a, uh, like for instance, he was a second director on a Cecil B. DeMille film. So these kinds of things, um, where uh, the Plainsman, in fact, so which is a very iconic Western film. Now just, uh, um, and this goes to my point here. This is a work by Jeff Thomas on the right here. It's called Indian Time. And uh, it's uh, uh, kind of a collage montage approach um, that quite a few indigenous artists have taken to reappropriating the image of sit from Curtis, in this case, quite directly. And, um, you know, trying to um, contradict the premise of the original film, or original photograph in this case, or make it more complex. And, uh, and in this case, uh, Thomas is uh, making a connection here. He's revealed the clock in the, in, in the corner. Oh, well, it's, it's just between uh, the two, two figures there. And uh, from, uh, that was uh, from the original plate of Curtis. But Curtis, when he uh, took his photograph and presented it, um, he took out the clock, right? Because he didn't want to show that, uh, that, they, that it was of now, right? And then, you know, with, uh, with Thomas's work too, he wanted to connect it to the very con contemporary landscape of the Toronto uh, streetscape. And uh, this was uh, uh, a clock that was out in front of an Art Deco uh, furniture store for many years, which was, was called the uh, Red Indian. And uh, so he was connecting it to that, uh, that work. And go to the next one. There we go. Another artist I thought I'd bring in is uh, Kent Moman, who's a, a Cree Métis artist, who's become very famous for his paintings, his large scale paintings. These are quite, quite large uh, works. This one is not as large as his normal works, but he's worked with these, uh, these kind of heavily romanticized painting genres and then appropriated that. Another famous uh, artist that was very similar to, to Curtis was uh, uh, Paul Kane. He was a painter that went out and tried to document the Canadian frontier uh, and uh, did these kind of very European-esque uh, romantic landscapes and put indigenous peoples into them uh, in a very romantic ways that were actually uh, reminiscent of, of um, uh, um, what would you say? Uh, in the Greek mythology and things like that in terms of their poses and stuff like that. So, so did Curtis with uh, and this pose of the person in the background 
is uh, from a Curtis photograph of a fisherman who's, of course, nude and, in, in, and uh, throwing the spear. And you see Curtis in the foreground here yelling directions to him how to throw the spear to be more uh, 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 photogenic. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, witnessing this is, uh, of course, uh, Kent Muckman is always a little bit tongue in cheek. He uh, has these characters called Mischief Testicle uh, and uh, uh, Mischief Shadow Catcher. Um, mischief being a play on words. Um, and also uh, playing with this kind of two-spirited gender kind of bending kind of thing that he, that he is himself. And uh, uh, he presents that in, the, in these landscapes at the same time. Uh, on the right, you have uh, what is called, uh, which is uh, titled Emergence of a Legend. And this is from a series, Miss Chief Shadow Catcher, and uh, where um, he takes on the persona of the photographer. And then is, uh, he has self portraits done. So, she, as the case may be. Um, I, you know, um, he always does these quite elaborate, glamorous performances as well that kind of right, dresses up kind of like how Cher would have done in the 1970s. Kind of thing. <coughs> but you get this sense that there's a, an approach to taking the image, reconfiguring it appropriating it, in some cases quite directly, like Jeff Thomas's, but recontextualizing it to complicate the image. Okay, and this is my project, so um, one of my projects. So um, this is called the Media, this is part of a longer project. It involves video installation, photo montage, and other things. Um, and this is uh, what I've tried to do with these portraits. These are toys, um, and toys that were made by a German company uh, um, in, um, early 2000s, I think. I don't think you can get them anymore. It's part of the Wild, Light, Wild West series. It's uh, made by Schleck. I don't know if people know that uh, toy brand. If you have kids, you might. They're, um, uh, um, they do these very detailed farm animals and things like that. Um, and, and in this case, they did these very detailed Wild West figures. Um, uh, uh, Sioux Medicine Man um, and uh, a couple others. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've photographed them in the style of Curtis. And then I've also made them uh, 3D in, or, in referencing, you know, the 1950s kind of 3D films, the anaglyph, uh, you know, we have the red and the green, green uh, glasses on, and it makes them pop out at you. Yeah. So if we had the glasses right now, these would pop off the screen at you, but uh, they don't right at the moment. Um, and this is two pieces, uh, one's called, uh, which is just, uh, structured in a way based on a sequence or scene from uh, E.S. Curtis's In the Land of the Headhunters film, which I'll talk about in a second. This is just to give you an idea of the installation. These are really large prints, and they're made for light box. So um, they're, they're backlit, so the light projects out at you. Um, kind of enhances the effect of the 3D image. Um, and this is, uh, this is I, I put this in because it, it's like the start of the, uh, uh, of the project, original project. Uh, and, you know, uh, Curtis's work is very much about that salvage ethnographic kind of approach. Um, and his original uh, image on the, the left here um, is called Vanishing Race. Um, and it was one of the initial photographs he did. And you can really see the pictorialist style or aesthetic that he took on rather than the documentative style which um, later on people sort of imposed on his work, this kind of documentary kind of approach when it really was supposed to be more romantic in nature. Um, and uh, here uh, I kind of recreated it with these toys in different ways. Again, in the 3D uh, effect. Um, and, and then as part of his work, he uh, took on, and this is where it gets kind of a little bit more interesting, and you see um, this work uh, really integrate into the popular culture um, in various ways. But uh, In the Land of the, the Headhunters was uh, a film that he went and, and started with. Um, he filmed it uh, in Vancouver Island um, in the North End, uh, on, mostly on a small island called Deer Island. And I'll show you the map of that in a minute. But um, he created this film not as a documentation of anything. 
He was just, he was there working with the, the community. He wanted to create a film that he thought would um, be a money maker for the bigger project. So, 20 minutes, okay. That should be good. Um, and then, um, so he created this film. It, it didn't do very well. Had a few good showings and it disappeared. It ended up in a trash can outside the Field Museum uh, and where someone found it in Chicago. And uh, someone picked it up and then kept it. But it wasn't a complete copy. Uh, later on, um, in the 70s, 60s, late 60s, 70s, um, it was re-edited, trying to recognize it or trying to fit it into an early documentary kind of style. So a lot of the melodrama was taken out of it. A lot of the 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 uh, the, the dialogue cards and stuff. Remember, this is a silent film. Was taken out of it. A new soundtrack was put on it. Um, that was changed and it was retitled in the land of the war caves. Then um, uh, in 2013, there's a new project where they found some old archive footage in the UCLA, well, UCLA archives as well as um, uh, the original archives from the Field Museum and they re-edited a new version. Um, uh, and we'll, I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, created a new project from that. Uh, here, um, I just wanted to give a quick, quick shot of where we're talking about. This is from Google Earth. Here. Uh, uh, you know, Port, Port Hardy up there in the northern tip of Vancouver Island, and then Deer Island is just a little bit off of the coast there of um, Vancouver Island. You can see Vancouver there, Victoria at the bottom. Um, and here's the. Uh, uh, so they had two things. So there's a book that's created with a lot of documentation of how how they went about recreating the film again, uh, retitling it. Uh, a lot of the work they did with the community. Um, they also found copies of the original score. So they redid that as well. And then uh, they created the uh, uh, new DVD version, which you can get um, if you so choose. <laughs> um, and it. Uh, um, it, it talks a lot about the process and everything that in, uh, in document, uh, as a documentary as well. Um, what's unique now at this point is when they screen the work, or when they screened it the first few times anyway, they bring in um, descendants from the film who then perform some of the sequences from the film, so some of the dances and things like that. So there's this kind of reclaiming of agency for the community and reclaiming of, of the film, which was in a large part was kind of discredited for long periods of time. So there is, is that aspect to it and it empowers the community uh, now as this kind of uh, thing that they can perform and take ownership of again as co-creators as, as opposed to uh, just hired actors. So part of what I, I did when I started my project was I started recreating the sets in 3D animation. Um, these were done in large installation kind of formats uh, with big screens and people could walk through the, the environment and as they walked through it triggered different uh, sequences of films that would connect Curtis's work to some of the images you found in Hollywood. Um, you know, a bare-chested Indian, this kind of uh, process. Um, um, and uh, um, it also recreated a kind of a soundscape as people moved through the environment. I think we have three minutes. I then wanted to seek a way to connect it to the toys of the original photographs. So instead of having the interactive element, people walking through, people were um, able to move the toys around on a table, which would trip different sequences of video and films. And uh, um, they, uh, while there wasn't a particular video attached to either object, um, just the movement across the surface of the table would create uh, a new kind of edited version. People could then re-edit the Curtis film as they felt they would. Um, later on, I kind of took this a little bit more specifically, um, and I created these uh, stands, which had RFD uh, chips in them, so that each figure had its own set of films that people could connect. And as you moved them around on the table, they would trigger different images, and you would have the, uh, the set rotate in the, the middle and then projected onto it would you have these little clips and loops that would play. Again, people would be able to um, uh, make their own film as it were. And then uh, I honed this a little bit more 
um, and I created zones on the table so that it became clear how to interact with it. And uh, um, now what happens is individuals can move an object onto a field and the combination will change the videos. And they'll also correspond to the, the space on the wall. So if you're on the left, it'll be an image on the left, right? Et cetera. Um, and here, just to get an idea, I don't always get an opportunity to show the photographs and the installation at the same time. But when they do, I think that's when it really works because then you have the connection right from the object all the way through to the image and the image creation. And I think, um, just, to, are we at time? Uh, maybe, how long is it? I, uh, well, I can just uh, play a little okay. bit to uh, get a, a sense of what happens when people do their mixing. And the sound gets generated too. Let's see that this is a, some clips from the Plainsman on the right that are intermixed as people move the toys. There's a young Anthony Quinn. It's a little glitchy. It's very experimental in, the, in its effect. Of course, glitch is kind of a style now, right? So, and you get rock cuts in it. And it goes through various, various things. Death of Bill, Little Big Horn, those kind of things. And is that it? And that's it. So there we are. Um, and just because, you know, uh, this, uh, um, uh, normally Mike and I do a little uh, perform, uh, we do presentations together, and it's a little uh, schizophrenic, as we like to say, because uh, we both have different angles on the same subject. Um, and uh, um, uh, this time we decided to separate out and we would do our presentations separately. Um, but if you want the full schizophrenic effect, <laughs> you can read the essay that kind of documents uh, uh, a lot of what we've been talking about or what I've been talking about here today. So thank you all um, uh, for your patience. Uh, we allow one question. <coughs> Any question? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, without going into the whole art history lesson, I mean, you, when you take a look at work like uh, Jeff Thomas, I could have added more artists in there, I suppose, but I, I want to keep the timeline down here. Um, there is this approach to um, taking an image, and, and it also comes out of uh, a lot of feminist artwork of the uh, 60s and 70s, well, no, maybe the 70s and 80s, uh, but uh, um, and on a similar timeline, you see a lot of indigenous artists taking, taking an image, uh, reappropriate, like one that is already appropriating culture, right? Like Curtis is where he's appropriating culture. Then taking it, reappropriating it. And you know, Jeff Thomas's work is great for this because it, it shows it kind of as a diptych quite often or as a triptych where he's connecting it to the current context, you know, and, and uh, kind of shattering the myth at the same time as, yeah, as reconstructing a new image, right? A more, a more complicated image. So that's the kind of methodology that we're talking about here, this kind of revealing the mechanisms beneath. And that's what I try to do in my work, reveal the mechanisms um, and that connection to the historical, um, that, that, that very European notion of a romantic savage, noble savage, those, those, kind, those are two different things, but those kinds of things and how they permeate all the way through to contemporary popular culture, including if, if one has seen the new Avatar movies, they are exactly that. I mean, there's not much difference from that and say, Dances with Wolves from the 1990s, right? Something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a lot of time. Oh, okay. I actually have a lot of questions for you from uh, visual art and I don't do but I will keep it later. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, our next presenter is from uh, National Taiwan University. Ah, no problem. Okay, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I learned so much from everyone's presentation uh, because I'm a newcomer. <laughs> Well, I'm not considered I'm myself as a, a young, you know, island study researcher, <laughs> but I'm really in the very beginning level. And uh, we learn so much. And uh, uh, the entire three days uh, conference is an uh, eye opening for me because there are so many small islands I was never aware of. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I feel like uh, it's, it's more like the, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at my research, I'm looking at the com continent, yeah. And uh, uh, by uh, com you know coming into this uh, conference, I realize I see all the small islands like the stars in the dark uh, night skies, and the, they are shining there. And I wonder why I never really see them for so long. And uh, by within this uh, um, 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 uh, line of thinking. And uh, our case study uh, is uh, self start from our self criticism. Start from our self criticism uh, because I have been engaging in the rural, um, o o especially the remote rural area, um, study for a long time. And uh, usually I take action research. So I have tea companies and I have <laughs> different <laughs> startups. And uh, uh, however, um, most likely we will look at the successful cases. Okay, the successful <coughs> cases is uh, what important for us. Yeah, and uh, today we are going to present three case studies. So uh, in terms of, of the time uh, management, we are in trouble. Okay. But nevertheless, uh, let me start from here. Um, we are challenged, you know, ourselves. Instead of looking at the successful cases, this time we want to look at the oh, the keep trying, the keep trying, you know, keep trying and the vision driven cases. And we wonder why these people, you know, why these people they are not really successful. But they persistently stay uh, in these small islands or in these remote rurals. Yeah. And uh, we realize there are two domains are important. One is the identity of the actors. Uh, they have some deep you know, belief, values, and faith. And the second part is the resilience of their actions. The resilience of their actions um, construct with uh, four dimensions. Let me go fast. Uh, the motivation, the networks, the strategy, and the resources. You know, e even though they are not so successful, and even though their career is very bumpy, however, they still want to do something in deep in their heart. Okay, and uh, uh, our three cases, we realize they are all related to SDGs the sustainable development, uh, those uh, 17 indicators. And uh, uh, within our cases, they, we including the returnees and the relational population and the immigrants. And uh, uh, here they are uh, for oh, here. OK. Uh, the first case uh, is Ding uh, Dingyong DR. And uh, she started eventually from 2005 till now. And uh, this is the Penghu Island. And what she has been doing related to the quality of education and uh, uh, the um, clean water and, uh, uh, you know, and the climate action. And uh, the second case uh, is Awen. Uh, he is uh, in the Lanyu Island. And his work is re also related to the climate action and the life in water and the life in land. And uh, the the, the third project related to uh, Yo Ren and the stars, his mentor, and uh, their work related to the non-poverty, decent work, uh, you know, bring up equality, reduce inequality, and uh, the sustainable uh, urban and the rural uh, life. And uh, here is our uh, main research question: Is 
as I mentioned before, why do they continue their challenging SDGs island careers? And how can we define the resilience of their island SDGs actions? Okay, and uh, we are going to, uh, um, you know, by explain their stories, uh, but focus on, you know, you know, their, uh, after they confronting the long-term challenges, they still trying to develop their vision by different ways. And uh, no matter by immigrating or returning, and how they are experience, experiment socially, culturally, and environmentally transform their islands, and uh, within their initiatives, and how have they sustained their local wisdoms and the ecosystems and the cultural diversities. Th these are the key points we want to uh, address. And uh, here is the research methods. Uh, our research, research is based on the qualitative research. And uh, we, did, we, we have been done um, in deep interviews for multiple times, partic particip long-term participatory organization and the life experience mapping, especially the action study we engage within the, their action. And uh, uh, these are the three cases, as I already mentioned, so I don't want, want to repeat again. And uh, here is the first case, the marine learning use. And uh, this is Kim Rong. And uh, um, this is uh, her um, sculpture she did uh, back in 2014. And uh, it's uh, with uh, the drifting woods. And uh, this is the picture that uh, we, I take uh, you know, in my <coughs> office uh, this year. So she reunited with her sculpture. And uh, this is a Penghu. This is a small island. Well, compared to many of the islands here, this is a, already a big island, OK? <laughs> yeah, because we have, you know, we, we have what, more than 1,000 people. And uh, we have uh, you know, se seven uh, you know, uh, uh, ki uh, kilometers, square kilometer. And uh, the density is you know, 200 and, uh, and, uh, and 12. And uh, this is the regular uh, uh, Penghu's uh, resident, resident population. And here is the tourist population. Okay, the tourist population is double the, 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 the regular. Yeah, but uh, we will talk about Lanyu later. That's even dramatic. Yeah. And uh, so here is the uh, mapping of the uh, Ding Rong's life experiences. And uh, uh, what's the most important thing is uh, uh, she worked with her mentor, Tom, uh, back in 2002. And her mentor passed away. Uh, two years ago uh, in, in, in cancer. Uh, so she went through a very uh, sort of uh, um, very bumpy ups and downs, but nevertheless, uh, she, still, um, she still told me, you know, she's going to stay in the island and that she still want to do the summer camp and the, all the uh, coastal clean and the uh, ocean conservation uh, actions. Uh, she had been doing uh, with Tom for back, you know, for more than two decades. Yeah, and the, oh, sorry, and the, for for the, the case I'm going to talk about, we only focus on the number B and the number D. Yeah, we, we have no time to cover all of them. Yeah, here is a a, a, a very short video. Just give you just give you a a, a, a little. Uh, Oh, okay, okay. Just, just do it, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Just give you uh, some image, you know, image about the. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, just some image of the ocean, the um, fishes, and the, uh, the diving courses, and the, uh, and some activities. Yeah. And uh, what's important is uh, even though. Uh, Taiwan is an island ourselves, but we have none of this kind of curriculum for any of our students. So none of our young children or young people have been training all these camp classes. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so for... Yeah, so uh, what important thing that uh, Ding Rong and their group have been doing is uh, um, they sort of uh, um, create 
a curricular development methodology that uh, how to generate the uh, children's uh, uh, ocean-related curriculum through the children's mind and the children's uh, activity. Because they are very uh, emphasized on the self-motivated issue-based learning. And, uh, and uh, th this is the structure. Uh, back in the older years, they probably already uh, cultivate more than 500 these kind of uh, uh, young people in Taiwan, they are very, very familiar uh, with ocean and with all the activities and with all the uh, environment. And uh, these people, this group, they will, of course, you know, uh, you know influence uh, other uh, people they encounter. And these are the um, values and the, and, the, and the principles they uh, emphasize. It's, uh, uh, cultivating daily relationship, appre uh, appreciation, diversity, and uh, developing, developing self-motivated learning. And uh, uh, what they emphasize the most is issue-oriented self-motivated learning. And uh, they do it as the personal project, and uh, they uh, give all the freedom for the children in their camp. So these are how they sort of do it. For example, they observe and then they talk to the uh, senior uh, fishermen, and uh, they figure out you know, what they, their interest is. Uh, for example, uh, this kid, uh, she is very interested about the fishing boat fishing, okay? And, uh, and this is, uh, she is very interested in the fun of diving, so he studied all, all different kind of uh, gestures and uh, the experiences uh, from diving, and, uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he's trying to map him and uh, 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 mark him uh, all the personal morning stroke stuff. And uh, he is trying to uh, decide, you know, uh, how, how to pick up the good drift goods. And, uh, and this is the way they, they try to, you know, experiment with different drift goods. And this is the more study. Only oh, have five minutes. Okay, so this is the... Uh, uh, this is a more glo you know, global uh, ocean-related uh, activities about uh, coastal cleaning and uh, even guiding to clean. And uh, they also got the community initiative, the, the uh, coral reef um, conservation area. And uh, this is a uh, uh, student, student also uh, did a research. And uh, that's bring the uh, sea turtle back to the ocean. and. Uh, the, the sea turtles also come from the Langley area. Okay. And the second case is from Langley. And Langley is a uh, Dao people's home. It, and in this island, there are Dao people and other indigenous groups and Han Chinese people. And uh, there are 5,000 people in this island, but uh, there are about 1,000 to uh, 2,000 people working on the mainland, not in Langley. And then see this is the traditional clothes and the traditional house. And they, uh, Lanyu is uh, in the southeast of Taiwan. And there are two 7-Eleven on the, on the east island. Many uh, tourists in this island. About uh, half a million people annual in, in this island will come to this island to, 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 to Lanyu. So uh, they take a lot of uh, garbage in this island. And because of this problem, uh, the young man, Arwen, is starting to uh, do environment education. When he was young, he worked in a printing factory uh, in the north of Taiwan. After returning to Lanyu, he worked in various businesses, such as renting motorcycle, selling hand trade, running a grocery store, and so on. And in 2014, he began to uh, recycle plastic bottle. And in 2016, I started building the bed bottle house. This is his bed bottle house. And this is pet bottle fish, uh, flying fish. And they will uh, uh, do many uh, beach cleaning. And about 
the layer networking outside of doing environment and touching on his own, but then started recruiting volunteers from outside the area and use on the island and gradually build up a team to continue the process. And but the major majority of human resources are still local uh, volunteers. Uh, bond, bond, volunteers uh, every year uh, have many patients and to help our to do this environmental education. However, at the end of 2022 was the lowest point for the team. The team has the 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 had, had the support of the government program for three years, but in the last year, um, the team was disbanded. Awen is now back on his own. Despite this frustration, uh, Awen continues to work on environmental education because of his belief and his Dao Al. His, because of his belief in his Dao Al hope, he continues to uh, do so with or without resources. And the third, uh, third test is uh, mushroom journey. And it's located in the north of Taiwan. And the tribe is, uh, it is Taya people. They live a, the area is about 600 to 1,200 meters above sea level. It's a very deep mountains indigenous area. And population about 3,000, uh, 90,000. Okay, and uh, the company is, is to uh, cultivate the mushroom. And this is our team members, uh, uh, team leader, uh, Lawa and me is Baladi, and my, my boss is Star. And we cultivate mushrooms, Brazil mushrooms, and King Oster mushrooms. And this is the timeline. We uh, started, the company was established in 2014. And then I, I joined the team in 2021. It's a, a all new team. Yes, we, we, uh, the last team is, is disbanded. And our business model is uh, we will uh, provide an education chance to the tribes for improving mushroom production efficiency. And then we're selling and promoting mushroom and related products after purchasing mushrooms from the LA tribes. And one thing we're selling a product to retail restaurants, group buying, um, tribal, uh, cooperation, leisure tourism characteristic, and the network is about um, we we have a strong network in team leader because he is indigenous indigenous local indigenous people, and uh, uh, we and me I'm Taiwan Taiwanese in indigenous people in Taiwan, and we uh, make a lot of uh, cooperation with local people. And this is uh, this is a powerful connection between indigenous people. And the CEO uh, he connect to uh, the church and the chairman. It bring the chairman to this uh, this town. And this is comparison uh, of three cases. And our conclusion is with bumpy career path, why do they still continue their SDGs island dreams? Um, they, the inspiration we take from their island challenge and their resilience comes from a belief in sustainability. And we uh, know that uh, they have every case that includes uh, four actions motivation, network, and strategy, resources. And thank you very much. Uh, well done, Team Taiwan. So I would like to invite uh, one quick question. And this is a project-based research based on three case studies.
I'm just curious, are most of these small islands, uh, I, from the map, they're around Taiwan's main island, right? So uh, are they mostly, the, the biggest industries here are tourists from mainland, the mainland, Taiwan, is that right? Yeah. Um, is there, that, that's the main Tata. sort of industry? Sorry, I can't keep it. Yeah, yes. Question. Yeah, mostly <coughs> are domestic. Mostly yes. domestic, yeah. domestic, and, uh, and also uh, for Lanyu and the Penghu, uh, there are also Japanese and the Korean. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. It, I suppose some kind of tour or something. Or, and what is the state of the indigenous people in Taiwan? Are they uh, using the language in school education? Um, he is an indigenous. Yeah, he is. <laughs> um, guess context. Um, there have been some yeah, discussions about whether that's uh, have a positive impact or a negative impact. And one opportunity is that can promote destination via like, online word of mouth. So tourists are promoting, sort of creating the, um, the island as a tourism destination. And it can also attract international tourists to um, regional rural communities, usually international tourists are not coming to these small islands. But however, there are some threats, so this tourism boom may be just short term, maybe just fade out after a few years, or it can be um, unpredictable. So your place, your island may become international tourist destination overnight, and you're not ready for it. In the context of animal tourism case, there well, is a study uh, that compared different uh, cat island situations, and there have been some mixed findings as to like how locals responded to this tourist-driven uh, tourism development. So there are some rooms for investigation. And I have been um, doing a research on Rabbit Island in Hiroshima. Uh, the official name is Okunoshima Island. <laughs> the case of Rabbit Island is a little bit complicated because the species of rabbit on the island is invasive or listed as invasive alien species. So, first of all, they shouldn't be on the island. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> However, they have been on the island. I'm going to explain about the history soon, but they started, well, tourists started coming. Um, and I was looking at why they're coming to see these like rabbits that are kind of familiar with us. And they basically come to the islands um, because they're cute and they, actually, they are not like afraid of people, so they also like tourists usually feed the, um, feed the rabbits, and so they enjoy feeding the rabbits, have a closer interaction with the rabbits. I, I call it like a natural petting zoo where tourists can really interact with the rabbits on the island. And this become sort of, sort of um, yashi, like heat healing, so tourists feel Yes, I did, um, healed by the, this interaction. And often the, um, the visitors coming to the island call the place as a paradise, like a rabbit heaven or paradise of rabbits. So in the context, well, so far I've been looking at the, why tourists are coming to the island. So. But in the context of this tourist-driven tourism where invasive alien species became a tourist attraction. How does the local community adapt and respond to the changes in their environment? So that's kind of a leading question in my research here. So just to give you an um, idea of where this island is located. Does it work? So we are on the red dot, that's Miyajima. It's Okonoshima Island, Rabbit Island is not so far from here, uh, it's about like 
two hours by train. And you can get there by speedboat or ferry. Yep, there's a dark history on the island. It's not just, it, it is like a cute rabbit on the island, but uh, the history, when you look at the history of the island, uh, it was used as a poisonous gas uh, production uh, site. So you see the, some ruins still remain on the island. And it was also hidden from the map uh, during the wartime period. But after the war, the island became more recreational um, site. So um, they was registered as the, a part of the National Setonaikai National Park. So the whole island is actually, um, or almost the whole island is, um, like a, a ministry of the environment is in charge of the, or owns the, owns the land. And this island is probably maybe the smallest island that's been presented in this conference, perhaps. <laughs> 0 0.7, yeah, square kilometers, so. Um, very small island. Actually, there are not residents on the island. But hotel workers, um, yeah, they stay on the island. There's, there is one hotel. And here's a tourist number. Uh, sorry, I only have until 2018, but you can see there's an increase and there's a peak at uh, 2016. And the uh, interesting thing about this island is that international tourist number has increased very rapidly. Uh, from 2013 to 2014 and 2015. So it has been attracting international uh, tourists. So let's take a look at some of the challenges that uh, locals <laughs> have on this island. And I highlighted three points. But yet when I say local, <laughs> because there's no residents living on the island, what do I mean by local uh, community? So island belongs to Takehara city. So Takehara city is on the left side of the map. Maybe I can see the person here. Yeah. And Tadano Umi, this is a town also belongs to Takehara city. Tourists usually take the ferry or speedboat from this, sorry, this port. And it only takes like five, 10 minutes to get to the island. And Tadanomi town is sort of divided by the road and the train track. So from the bottom, like just below these uh, train track, there's, um, there's a port side and this side is the town. It's like a town, the picture of the town is shown here. And here's the port, so the ticket, ticketing office, which has some like a rabbit merchandise and stuff. So. That's, these are the sort of community that I'm talking about here. So the main dilemma that they have been experienced or they had is that what do we do? Do they do with the invasive alien species that became a tourist attraction? It wasn't their intention to make, it, make them as a tourist, tourism attraction. And for a long time, until maybe 2018, these rabbits on the island are just kind of left as they are. So Ministry of Environment, I'm gonna say like MOE, they didn't do much about the situation. So they didn't have any management, they didn't have any well, official rules on the island. So these tourist and rabbit interactions are left as, yeah, just left. And yeah, they ignore the situation. So the eventually volunteer or like maybe rabbit fans started forming a volunteer, so the self self organized volunteer activity. It's called Usakatsu. I have to have another presentation to talk about that, so I can't really explain in depth about those um, people, but they started um, watering, giving water to rabbits, um, picking up garbages, and sort of maintaining the island environment. Finally, in 2018, MOE started collecting sort of basic data about rabbit population, rabbit health, um, yeah, things like that in 2020 or 2019. That's right before COVID. Uh, we have 
uh, workshops and also the discussion, stakeholder discussion. And they officially declared that the island's rabbits will not be eradicated, okay. which yeah, means that they're going to be sort of used as a tourist, tourism attraction. And after the, uh, during the COVID, rabbit population dropped. 2019 was the year when a lot of um, mass media was talking about the overpopulation of the rabbits. They saw it as a very a problem. problem. So these are some of the um, problems that they identified during the workshop. Some accidents, uh, some people just random pets, uh, yeah. poor welfare, also over tourism was the problem on the island. And also excess food, tourists come and just leave their um, food for the rabbits that became kind of, that attract other animals like boars and rats, so those are the problem. And another point, as observing that how the community has been changing over the last, I've been doing this research for like, since 2016, so I've been looking at the community for about seven years, but um, so far the observable change is only really seen at the port, and not much is happening in the actual, like a Taranomi uh, town. Uh, so there's no new stores related to um, rabbits. So the third dilemma <laughs> to challenge is that there is a lack of stakeholder uh, cooperation. Uh, so Takehara City, they're actively promoting tourism. Uh, they make tourist brochure or promotion video. Uh, they also did sort of painting activities in the Taranomi town. But some of these activities MOE are not aware of. So they actually contacted me whether I know about their, what they were doing. So there is no maybe um, co communication between these um, stakeholders. And Taranomi residents, they are, they don't really, they, they sort of disconnect themselves from the, you know, rabbit island to, you know, they have their maybe own identity, cultural identity. So they're not uh, taking advantage of that opportunity. So this last year, they, um, yeah, they started this Okonoshima Mirai Zukri, so future, Creating Planning Committee. Uh, so this is a new, very new system that implemented on the island or the whole community. And under this committee, there's a subcommittees of like rabbit, focusing on rabbits, promotion, and tourism. And their goals uh, are to coexist with rabbits and improve the island environment. And also to achieve sustainable tourism uh, development through the cooperation of uh, multiple stakeholders inside the island and also outside the island. So Takehara City and uh, Taranomi Town. And the key term they sort of highlighted was the partnership, through the partnership and through uh, the cooperation. So that might be um, the factor that we can, they can overcome their like these challenges that they are facing uh, in the context of the tourist tourism driven uh, animal tourism situation. So I will be looking at the, um, this case uh, the next maybe continue to look at this um, case from now. So uh, this is kind of uh, my preliminary results. So uh, this concludes my presentation. So thank you for your attention. Perfect timing. I know we have uh, five minutes for Jeremy. Yeah. If I have any question related to not only rabbit, but also the deer, the expert wants to ask about that. Uh, so, what are the populations of rabbits for all in 2020? 2020. It dropped. So, it dropped from 1,000 to 300. Wow. 
Why? Why was that? Why was that? Because tourists were feeding oh, the rabbits. Sorry, right. maybe I didn't explain that <laughs> in detail, but yeah, tourists are the source of yeah food. So <laughs> the rabbits starved. Hmm? The rabbits starved. Started. Starved. Starved to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Is it, is it Is there, is there a natural predator for the rabbits on the island? Is there a natural predator? Yes, crows, but crows, crows, crows oh, yeah. um, for the like, smaller rabbits, but not, not for you don't have like, you know, wolves. Cats. <laughs> well, cats were brought to the island once, mm -hmm. but then I don't think they're there anymore. Um, boar has been eating the rabbit, like the cars, but not. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, I, was, I almost went to this uh, about 10 years ago, <laughs> but uh, one of my professors in the exchange program was really, he, he was a history guy, so if he wanted to take us there, uh, he's like, yeah, if you know the rabbits, we got to check out this uh, war stuff. Uh, so I was wondering, do you think maybe that this, um, Rabbit tourism, do you, do you think maybe it's masking this very, you know, the, the poison gas production, that's like dark tourism, very, I don't know, complex past, right, that I think maybe a lot of people would not want to talk about. Uh, do you, so, uh, in your research, do you feel like maybe the rabbits are a very good setup to forget about uh, that part of the island? Um, and uh, also, do you think maybe that's part of uh, it is the Iyashi mm. thing? So mm -hmm. I, I'm not too sure about this, but I've mm. seen the presentation. I've read this thing. So okay. uh, again, I've seen all the studies you talk about yeah. Iyashi yeah. films okay. and so I don't know, maybe that's around the same time. Well, your question of whether rabbits are a good way to forget about the past, the dark past, it definitely changed the image of the island. I grew up in Hiroshima. I went to this island as a kid, and this place was for like learning peace, like for the peace studies for kids. And for me, the island was always like the island that was removed from the map. It was never like rabbit island. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely since 2014, this uh, rabbit tourism boom, the island image changed, at least from the point of, you know, tourists. But I, s I know some local people who are kind of uneasy about this, you know, development, like rabbits. I guess people focus a lot on ra rabbits, but they don't learn about the history. When you go to this island, you can't really, I guess, forget or ignore the dark history because these buildings are still there. There is um, a museum, a poisonous gas museum, so it, it is there. It, they're not trying to even hide it. But yeah, that's... Yeah, maybe. Uh, sorry, we have one line okay. before. So Christian, do you want to ask by yourself? Christine, do you want to ask? It, it, it wasn't me, it was Chia. Ah, Chia, okay. So, his question is uh, Rabbit is part of the island or original culture now? Uh, what are the local perceptions? Hmm? You want to know the, what locals' perception about Oh, the yeah. So, local, <coughs> I talked to some local people about the situation on the island, and they, like I said, they sort of disconnect themselves. Like, they don't. They are not really welcoming. It's either because they can't really take this opportunity. <laughs> Big, uh, tourists are not coming to their town, so they might just feel like they don't know what to do with the situation. Or, but for me, it feel like they have different identity. So they have more. Um, they have this yukata festival that they put so much effort into, it, you know, doing every year. So I think they never really associate themselves with the image of rabbits. But that's based on my observation. For the I think just uh, as just a simple question, where did the rabbits come from originally? Sure. 
rabbits. You know? Oh, the rabbits came Where from? Where did the rabbits come um, from? Yeah, there's... Right? No. Well, we don't know. We don't... <coughs> no one really knows. There are four different stories that I heard. We don't know what's the yeah, origin of these rabbits. Okay, Where? one last question from Chris. Hi there. Um, at Men, when I was asked it, could you turn the screen back around, please? Because the sound would be funny when you turned it. Um, but just, I have already got a question because I'm really interested in the fact that um, you were saying the island was previously known for kind of a, a more dark history. And I'm wondering if, when people visit, we, we often find in Scotland people come to an island and they have this idea that it will be this certain thing, this paradise. And they turn up, and then actually, when they're faced with things that don't quite meet those expectations, they get a little bit annoyed and disconcerted by the fact that the island is the thing they expected it to be. So I'm just wondering if there is any tension there, and whether whether there are, you are finding tourists who are annoyed that the dark history is still kind of very much present, um, because they're there just to enjoy the island. I did um, tour trip advisors, you know, review comment review uh, analysis, and then I found that they were annoyed by this like long wait at the ferry terminal and never really annoyed by the dark history of the island. They are quite kind of um, what's the word? Good word. Um, when they found out there's a dark history, that sort of added the value to their experience sort of, kind of, strange, sort of, yeah, experience. Mm. Okay, thank but there's you contrast, much. right? Thank you. Thank you. Now, finally, we attain our last presentation by our photographer, Pasco. Pasco is at his last year of his PhD, and his topic is about the two heritage islands, including this island. I guess everyone already worked on this island for 3D. You might have a lot of questions in terms of the shrines. Mm -hmm. Pasco is an expert uh, for this topic. But all the professors here, please also help Pasco to have a lot of insightful finding and suggestion to improve his final paper. Okay. Mm. okay. Okay, I think everyone can hear me even if I speak without the microphone. Okay, thank you. Um, so be with me at 15 minutes. I try to do it fast. Uh, my press, uh, this is part of an ongoing uh, research about shrine tourism on two areas in Japan. One is Miyajima, the other one is in Monakata. And uh, here we go forward. Uh, the objective of this presentation is to provide some insight into the local stakeholder perspectives. And with this I mean uh, tourism, shrine officials, people who live and who work there, on how the area and the shrine has changed since it became a World Heritage Site, and also how they might want to change tourism after the pandemic, because the research took place during the pandemic. And by doing so, combining the word uh, heritage inscription, islands, and corona as a momentum for people to think about change, we look into how sacred heritage on islands and tourism with it might have changed or should change. Uh, considering studies of island tourism, um, there are not many who focus on islands that are part of a country. Many studies focus on separate islands, but only a few on smaller islands, like in this case. Uh, islands are an ideal place for... Okay, demolishing. Um, for actually doing research on topics due to their limited geographic space, and also um, they need the support of the host community, as we will see in the later case. Uh, with the World Heritage Site inscription, um, local communities' views are needed for 
the long-term success of the program. It is one of the requirements that the local community or the people who live within the inscripted area agree or there is a votum. Recently there has been one in Germany for a castle. Uh, around 55% voted for yes, 45% voted for no. If this is a clear decision, I leave up to everyone else. So the global community is really important, especially those who might not support it. Um, very often, uh, people then focus after the inscription on the inscribed features, but forget the overall destination. And the whole impact of the conservation uh, must be considered all around, uh, especially where communities are socially and economically vulnerable. And I think this very much fits to all kind of islands. Ah, sorry, Corona. And there have been a lot of studies on Corona, especially at the beginning and throughout. Many researchers found that Corona could be an opportunity to reset the tourism industry. They argued that, especially for rural and marine environments, uh, the attention has to shift from, quality, uh, from quantity to quality. And one of the problems that also showed to, to the pandemic, um, that if the lo people lose their incomes, they will move away. And this means, in terms of the islands, I'm researching further depopulation. For the case sites, Amiyajima, which you're here, and Munakata Taisha in Fukuoka. Uh, Miyajima is inscribed since roughly 30 years, uh, Munakata since six years. The population across the core site of inscription is roughly the same, but I have to say that Munakata, the World Heritage Site, stretches across three places. Both have schools, but compared to Miyajima, where students even come from Hatsukaichi or the, from the mainland to the school, on Munakata or on Ishima, people even share the same lecture. Uh, what we can see here is Miyajima. You see some beaches, some villages. And in Munakata, oops, wrong button. What you cannot see so well because maybe it's taken during the day, uh, you see actually a lot of fishing boats. So we see also how the uh, livelihood from the people, uh, where it comes from. And this development on Miyajima is also due to the fact that tourism is already quite old here. People used to come to Miyajima for a long time. During the Edo period, there was a lot of, let's say, men having a break from daily life and coming here for entertainment. There have been what you would nowadays call snack bars and so on, though maybe not as sacred as some people think. Uh, Miyajima is easily reachable. I don't have to talk about this. You all came here. Munakata is a different story. If you want to go to the island of Oshima, the one in blue, uh, you will travel from the nearest Shinkansen station around two hours. Uh, by train, bus, and ferry. And the island in red, which is also part of the inscription, you can't go at all because it is forbidden for normal people. Only uh, people from the shrine will go there. And bus times to go to the island once every hour. The ferry runs six times a day, so there are really limitations. And where you can't go, and that is also some of the discussion, is the island you're supposed to see somewhere there, which you can't see because it's too dusty, it's too far away, and there's even no sign, but some local people carved it into the stones. And this is the island, how it looks like you can't go there, that is part of it, because rituals took place, and they found some really old treasures from the 4th, 5th, 6th century, there, which came through to trading. So the whole site is very important. Population statistic-wise, uh, everything goes down. But uh, in recent years, we can see that it has been slowing down a bit. And comparing these two islands, they're also very close uh, with the aging. Uh, around 50% are 65 or older. Um, 
Since the inscription uh, for Munakata, it has been kind of fluctuating. Um, for Miyajima at the bottom, we can also see it since the inscription it went a bit down, it went pretty up. In uh, Corona, of course, it went quite down. And, but already in the last year, we could see that the ferry passenger numbers went quite up. So it is actually regaining. That is how Miyajima looked like during Corona at lunchtime. Uh, um, I did structured interviews with shrine and tourism officials, and Miyajima with two tourism officials because of access in Munakata. These ranged from uh, people who were in charge for the heritage to DMO to people from the shrine. And then uh, I did questionnaires with the residents and local uh, businesses, uh, either through mailing or while we were on site. For the demographic, male, female, around half of it, most of the people, especially for Munakata, live on the island or on the mainland. And by Miyajima, only half, most of them actually work there. And we can also see this uh, when we look at what kind of industry they work for. Around 75% are working in tourism related cases for Miyajima, while for Munakata, uh, it's around 20% for fishing, agriculture and only 10% in tourism, so it's much further spread. So the findings are that, and let me have a look on my notes, actually not so bad, time wise. Um, ah, here we go. Um, for the World Heritage uh, site, I only got the feedback from um, Munakata because six years ago it was inscribed, so there are many people still working uh, or have been already working since then, um, while for me at Gima it has been almost 30 years, so there's no feedback from them. Um, it's kind of a mixed reaction uh, overall, but first of all, from the official side, new structures were established, visitors increased, especially on the weekends, and for the people who live, or work on the island and in this area. Um, yeah, they found that more people came, but also nothing has changed because they found that the local government or the institutions are not doing it. But also some sadness, like in the case of Munakata, that trees have been cut down, but at the same time visitors are increasing, overnight guests are getting less. And what I did with all these uh, mm, with all these comments uh, through content analysis I started to code them and broke them down and for the World Heritage Site inscription and the changes uh, it turned out that these could be somehow grouped in three categories positive, neutral or unknown and negative why unknown? because especially for the uh, residents, they filled out a survey, gave it back to me. I could not intervene with them. And sometimes it was, they just wrote more tourists or more visitors. Is this something positive? Is this something negative? As it was standing on its own, I would have to group it as neutral. And we can here already see a big difference between the two areas. Uh, because you've been staying on Miyajima, you see there's a lot of infrastructure, there are a lot of people. So they found that since the island became a World Heritage Site, uh, there has been, oh not Miyajima, sorry, Munakata Taisha, uh, there are the negative ones uh, because uh, private property building restrictions, people wanted to build a new house, they can't do it anymore. Um, less people staying overnight, also you have more day visitors, uh, nature might have been harmed. But positive-wise, although they've all found, and this is similar with the officials, that the overall appeal or awareness has changed. Um, how did the shrine change? In general, it was felt very positive from the official side that there is more awareness, more education about the shrine than before. Uh, it has been become 
globally recognized, but also not as many tourists as maybe some had hoped. And for the people living on the island, yeah, they also found more people come. Uh, it has become more significant, but also some resentment that the old atmosphere might have got lost than before the inscription. And here we can see the peer, what I just mentioned, awareness has gone up. Uh, more people coming has become more popular, but also new buildings, uh, which could be seen as a positive or negative, depending on how you look at it. And from the negative side, um, that the atmosphere, for example, decreased. And as a sacred size, this has, might have an effect on the support of the local community who use this shrine. Um, the next part was to ask Sam if they saw any issues with tourism before Corona. And this depended on, uh, this differed a bit between the two sides. Some found they did not enough promotion. Others, like on Miyajima, rather found there's not enough toilets or places to uh, dispose their waste and also crowding. And here again, it fits with the view of the resident and the workers um, of both areas, especially for Munakata that the access is poor, which we have seen uh, before. And for Miyajima, maybe typical slightly typical issues. And this is really the big part uh, for issues before Corona, but the resident and people who work here is a nuisance from crowding to bad manners to litter. <coughs> While for Munakata uh, and Oshima, it is the infrastructure. We don't have enough restaurants. We don't have enough access. And it is surprisingly mirrored by the official side that yeah, in Munakata we have the infrastructure problems and for Miyajima we have the crowding and litter problems. Tourism after, they want especially more promotion, promotion of the history, of the stories, to have more leisure facilities, to promote longer stays and from the people uh, also that there is more cooperation that there should be focus beyond just the temple and the shrine and to offer more. And then my final remarks, because I only have 11 seconds left. Here we can see how Munakata changed what was mentioned by the people. Uh, they have received a new ferry terminal, a cultural center was built, and last year in October, it didn't exist last weekend, I went there. Uh, there are also new restaurants being opened after Corona. Uh, however, what did not very much change is you see on the left side here uh, the entrance at, in the morning to the shrine here, and this is in Monakata. The tourism was is a big difference. <laughs> this is in the afternoon the shopping street. This is in the afternoon the souvenir shop on the island. It's already closed while Miyajima is still full. So we see there is still a lot of problems. In summary, it helps us that uh, to better understand, um, it, let's, I just get to the last one. Uh, it's a question, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Especially in the case of Munakata, we can see, do they start building hotels, restaurants, <laughs> access, and then hope the people will come? Or do they wait for that more people will come and then do the rest? And thank you for bearing the last 15 minutes with me. We have uh, four minutes for turn. Oh, mm -hmm. ready. Thank you. Um, yeah, very uh, interesting uh, topics, and thank you for the comparison. So, uh, understanding that more is not always better, and also the fact that you mentioned quality is more important than quantity. Mm. Um, you know, how do we? I think the destinations need to identify. Right? Define what quality is. Does it is the quality mean uh, the higher spending tourist, uh, uh, better behave tourists with better behavior? You know, you, you, you can have a lot of different definitions. So you know, 
So keeping that in mind, which is doing better? Is it, is it me and Jima? Or is it the other one? And so that's number one, question number one. And maybe, uh, 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 I guess, a uh, comment for number two on the line of the is that maybe the destination really needs to decide what, you know, what quality is and what, what do they want to do and then work from there. And the easiest way to measure quality if you just want to go by, yeah. by spending, if it's, if it's an economic thing, then, then I think that would be something to gather is this spending per, per visitor yeah. at the destination. Yeah. Um, you have to quickly answer this. Either, of course, for Munakata, it's a bit difficult to say because they got inscribed in 2017. Three years later, it came to a complete halt, like from May 2020 until uh, almost yeah until June last year, where the first foreign front front tourist groups came back to Japan. There was no travel. University-wise, we were almost for two years. We always had breaks in between. We could go out, then there was. Uh, in state of emergency, you couldn't go out. So in case of Munakata, they had two years to do something, and then it stopped. But now, since last year, October, they have already new facilities for eating. So I think there is something happening. But for Miyajima, I don't know, because when we compare this year, the passenger numbers, I didn't put them up, was before the corona, they're almost the same. So in terms of we want to do something maybe against crowding, Miyajima, I would say, is business back to usual. One, one last question. Okay. okay. I, I find it interesting that one of the others was in Okinoshima. Okinoshima, yeah. Okinoshima, where um, the shrine owns the whole island. Uh, it's a sacred island, yes. Yeah. It's a sacred island, and on there is one shrine, one shrine priest is living there for 10 days and then they get exchanged. And that was, thank you for bringing this up, I forgot it. Before the inscription, there would be an annual festival where 200 selected men would be able to go to the island, do the purification, pray on the island and return. But because it was only allowed for men, since the inscription, they completely cut this festival and it's not happening anymore, but none of the residents actually mentioned this or so for many of them they have been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years of their life and from one day to the next it was cut. So they are now there are only illegal people on the island fishing. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's what I was wondering about things like that. So, so they go on the island and it's considered illegal? Uh, yeah, they're, they're asked practicing. not to do it, they're not asked not to do it, only for emergency. Yeah. But as I went uh, two years ago with a boat around the island, I was surprised to see so many people fishing there. Right. And it's also difficult for tourists to get there because from the Oshima Island, where you just need two hours from the yeah. biggest town, you go another two hours one way by boat, and the sea can be very rough. So, so the shrine actually owns the island? It kind of own the island, you could say. So yeah. Yeah. there is no development. I think it's just accepted that this is a sacred island, yes. and uh, because okay. they also found so many things on the island, there was no discussion. That's really interesting. But don't ask me how it was in the no. history. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you very much. Now we're finally finished.